Will democracy survive in the next couple of years? And essentially we are the same. And there are so many needs that Minnesota has. What people are saying they need right now. Access to democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. Crutchfield Dermatology, a full-service treatment center in Medispa in Egan. Their goal is to help you look good and feel great with beautiful skin. With service built around courtesy, dignity, and respect, Mayo-trained Dr. Charles Crutchfield personally treats each patient and is acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians. Firefly Credit Union, with locations throughout the Twin Cities, has proudly served Minnesotans since 1925. Firefly guides its members forward by delivering customized financial solutions to improve their lives in all aspects of banking. Firefly Credit Union, they light the way with life illuminated. Edina Eye, physicians and surgeons, a division of Twin Cities Eye Consultants, has proudly served the Twin Cities for more than 55 years. Now in seven convenient locations, using the most advanced technology combined with human touch, Edina Eye offers comprehensive services for dedicated specialists committed to excellence with innovative procedures and expertise for the most advanced eye care. And good afternoon. Access to Democracy is back. Alan Miller is back. And a favorite guest is back by the name of David House Wright, uh, one of our successful, most successful local, local authors here in Minnesota. And we're going to talk about a, a really incredible new book, among other things. And David, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate this. This is the first time I've worn a shirt with buttons in about three months. You know, I have been wearing one with buttons for the first two interviews, weekly interviews we did, and I decided today I'd go to the Access Polo shirt that the crew wears. So uh, you can see my yeah. Access logo there, and uh, <clears throat> let's hope that we have success, not access. But uh, David... What can I say about him as a writer? Uh, he has won so many awards that he had them all on the bookcase off his right shoulder and the bookcase collapsed. I mean, that's three, three times Minnesota, the best book award, uh, an Edgar a winner, uh, president of the, uh, what is it, the Crime Writers Association? Private ride, the Private Eye Writers of America. There you go. And uh, on the seventh day, he rests. What can I say? Uh, now, David has a new book coming out when? They postponed the publication date to Tuesday, July 24th. It was supposed to come out this week. July 24th is a Friday. Uh, no, it's a Tuesday. And it's not the 24th because that happens to be my birthday. Okay, 28th then. I, <clears throat> it's in July. Uh, okay. In the well, July. People, I want you to write down July 28th. And I don't know if you'll be able to go to the bookstores to get the book, or whether you're going to have to do Amazon or Barnes & Noble, which will mail it to you. Uh, oh, the local bookstores. Uh, Once Upon a Crime and, and, and Subtext and Chapter 2 and Next Chapter. All the local independent bookstores will be happy to take your order and, and send things out to you. And they really need it the most uh, yeah. in this pandemic time that we're in. Uh, I want to tell viewers, anyone who is going to, <clears throat> to get this book, Get a good night's rest before. <laughs> Get up very early, and you will not be able to put this book down until you finish it. Here we go. Can we see that? From the grave. And I have a copy as well. 
<laughs> I would hope you have a copy, but if you were good enough to see that I have a copy, a, a Rushmore McKenzie book, and we certainly know Rushmore McKenzie is one of your most uh, successful series, but a book different than anything I have read of yours, and that's quite a bit. Uh, it's a, well, let me describe it as the author describes it. It's a book about faith, or more accurately, belief. What do we believe? Is there life after death? Can we communicate with those who have died? And Rushmore Mackenzie, and we call him Mackenzie because nobody uses his first name, finds himself in the middle of a situation which involves psychics and psychic phenomena. How in the world did you get involved in this? Uh, my wife, uh, Renee Belois, uh, she started getting involved in paranormal research and psychics and this is real and not real and so on because of an incident that occurred to her uh, several years ago where she was actually standing there and she saw a tray filled with uh, uh, cosmetics fly across the room. And up until then, she, like most of us, you know, I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in spirits. I don't believe in this stuff. That's TV. That's movies. And so she started doing the research and started looking into it. So I had basically all of this information coming to me through her. And I started looking into it. You have to understand the book isn't really about ghosts. It isn't, you know, it isn't that story. It's about what people believe and what they take home with them. Uh, and when you leave this book, uh, there is a big question mark. Do you believe or do you not believe? Have you had any psychic experiences? And I will relate to you a little bit about two that I have had uh, in my lifetime. And I've always been a skeptic about anything outside the normal, except I always believed in UFOs. And uh, is that psychic or is that something that maybe exists, uh, you know, un undisclosed flying objects or uh, is that within the realm of belief or disbelief? I don't know. <laughs> You're asking me. Uh, I have never had an experience. A personal experience. I have spoken to people who have. I have spoken to people who are all in. Uh, I have I've spoken to psychics and and people like this and uh, you know I'm not going to try and convince anybody whether this is right or wrong or good or bad or true or not true. It's just uh, there's an awful lot of unexplained things going on and uh, this is one way people use to explain it. 40% of the people in this country believe in ghosts, believe in spirits, believe in the afterlife. 60% uh, don't. And it's really hard to convince one side or the other to, to, to shift. And basically, that's what the story is. I mean, if you believe it, then you'll do certain things. If you don't believe it, then you'll do other things. And that's really what the, the book is about. Well, Rushmore didn't believe it to start out, and he got sucked into it from Shelby, a close friend, uh, the wife of one of his closest friends, and that started the whole thing. And we certainly get enough experience with the two psychics in there, uh, one who is question questionably legitimate, and then one who apparently is really legitimate, Kayla. And uh, Kayla does have visions, and Kayla does have the capacity to communicate and bring things in uh, that people want to hear from the other side. And, uh, you know, I leave it to you, uh, and the book will leave it to you also as to where you believe, but it's just fascinating. 
Now, you did so much research, undoubtedly, for this, not only with psychics, but also uh, psychic conventions. I didn't even know there were such things. Uh, talk about that. Well, um, there are gatherings. Uh, uh, locally, you'll, you'll see conventions where people come and they'll sell their products and they'll, and they'll promote their books and so on and so forth. Uh, there's also international and national uh, events. There was one scheduled in Duluth in October. Now, whether or not that comes off because of, of the strange days we're living in, I don't know. But there's going to be a lot of people up there who are, who are psychics. There are people who are involved in the, uh, the TV shows uh, will be up there and, and so on and so forth. And like I said, this is an awful lot of people are all in on this. And even those who aren't, those, you know, you, you find the whole idea of it somewhat fascinating, whether you're a true believer or not. Well, it, it's even more than that. I mean, you, you talk about the get together or the convention, as I call it. And uh, I have a psychic feeling that my dog is wrapped around a tree in the backyard. I can't usually see that when we're broadcasting. But there she is. Uh, so many different items that are available for sale in terms of psychics and psychic phenomena and really the otherworldly thing. Uh, I was blown away. And uh, I just figured you had to spend a tremendous amount of time researching to get this project on, underway. Well, I, I take the research for all my books pretty seriously, uh, whether it's this or the art world or, or what have you. Uh, I think that's the problem that a lot of people have with uh, this world, uh, whether to take it seriously or not, because these people do have a product to sell. So, you know, you, you wonder how legitimate it is and, 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 what, and how honest the salesmen are being. Uh, so, yeah, you know, like I said, you, you, the book isn't meant to convince anybody w whether this is true or not. It's there to just explore this world that, as I said, 40% of the population believe in. And amazingly, uh, years ago, my family and I were on a skiing vacation in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and we stayed at a lodge that was known to be haunted. So I guess that's probably uh, part of psychic phenomena. It was right next to a graveyard, and uh, the fellow who used to own the lodge had committed suicide, and he was in the graveyard. And we knew that much of the story. Uh, we also were up there, my kids were small, we were up there with our dog. And you can't stop phones from going off apparently when you're in the middle of an interview, but we'll be more for that. Uh, so, we're all asleep, and allegedly this ghost is up on the third floor, we're on the second floor. Uh, the owners were on the first floor, and they had a dining room and everything else. And all of a sudden, the two dogs started bristling. The hair stood up. They started growling. And I, I woke up. Then I heard what sounded like a chain being dragged across the floor and down the steps from the third floor. Clunk, clunk, clunk. And so I jumped up and grabbed, I don't remember what, some kind of a weapon. Uh, and I threw open the door to the third floor and there's nothing there but the chain on the floor. So I immediately checked on the owners to see that they weren't playing a game on us and they were sound asleep. My kids were sound asleep. Everybody was sound asleep. There was nobody else there. But here is this big chain at the bottom of the stairs. Where did it come from? It wasn't there when we went to bed. Uh, so I leave it to you to explain that. <laughs> I'm not going to explain that. Uh, when 
I was uh, two years ago. And as I say, I am a, a really deep skeptic about all this. I had had a uh, thyroid cancer operation and I was at uh, the Mayo Clinic, St. Mary's Hospital. And uh, there are pictures around of the nurses going back to the 1800s and how they dressed and all. And I awoke at night and Sister Anne, one of the nurses, was in my room and dressed in costume. And she said, it's okay, you're going to be all right. And then she was gone. Well, my explanation the next day was, you are on some painkillers and all. You just had an operation. It probably had to do with that. But I haven't had any other explanation since. So what do you believe? Well, that's, that's what it comes down to. And I think most people would require a, a, an incident. They would require something happening uh, like the ones you described for them to, to come over to the belief in, in spirits and, and psychics and have what have you. Uh, you know, you watch a lot of shows on TV, and I did, uh, going into this. And an awful lot of it seems so uh, contrived that you have to step back and go, really? But then the, certain incidents occur that if you believe in, in what they're telling you is true, it makes you stop and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. makes you stop and wonder. Um, again, I've never had an experience, but I've met people who have or who, who claim they have. And what do you take away from that? I mean, you either believe them or you think they're nuts or they're you just not experience, so. but then you start to question yourself when you believe the experience, as, as I did on both of those occasions. Uh, you know, is it me? Is it my, my active mind playing games with me? Where did this chain come from on the floor? Uh, bouncing down the steps and the dogs growling and with the hair up on their back. I mean, two of them, you know, it, uh, uh, my ex-wife wasn't growling. She was asleep, but, uh, could have been three of them. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know. So after reading the book and I, I appreciate the fact that you sent me an advanced copy, I'm sorry that it's publication is delayed. Uh, I assume you're writing a book about pandemics right now, but uh, actually, I just finished a book about a week ago that I sent to my publisher, and I did work in a little bit, but uh, not a lot because I I don't know how this is going to shake out, and it wasn't really pertinent to the story. Uh, this is actually a debate. This is this is something that my writer friends have, have argued about, about whether or not you write about this. And I'm like, well, of course you do. I mean, this is of the world you, you live in. If your book takes place during the Vietnam War, that's part of the book. It's just a matter of how uh, much of it, I mean, it's a matter of what you need to tell your story. Is it just something that's going on while your story's taking place, or is it pertinent to the story? So, you know, it's, it's, you write about the world that you live in when you write your story. Stephen King seems to uh, have had a moderate amount of success, and I say that tongue-in-cheek, uh, writing about the other world. We, so uh, why not? And, uh, you know, I, I think that that's one of the great things about being a writer is it gives you the latitude to take your imagination and place it anywhere. And uh, that's, that's what you've done. And that's what you've done in this, in this book. And as I say, you come away uh, upon the, uh, from the grave, you come away either believing or not believing if you have the opportunity to. And you have filled it with a lot of references that are both supportive and not necessarily supportive, but skeptical. That's one of the interesting things about it. I just found it a fascinating read. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
How has your life changed in, the, in these last three months? Well, uh, I I'm lucky. I'm one of those those lucky few. I I I work at home anyway, so it's not that big of an issue to me. Uh, That's what I was wondering because you know, as a writer, you're used to solitude and you're used to working by yourself, uh, and you're used to being locked away. Uh, it comes as a shock. I, would, I wouldn't say locked away, but yeah. Um, I don't have to worry about money. I don't have to worry about whether my job's going to be there when this is over. I don't have children uh, about that I need to take care of and, and educate. Uh, I, I don't have to worry about a lot of things that an awful lot of people do. So it's, it hasn't been that uh, uh, difficult for me to deal with this. I mean, I miss doing the events. I miss doing the signings and the and the library events and things like this. I also miss going to see your live music. I miss baseball. But that's really kind of small compared to the issues a lot of other people are facing. So, you know, I'm I'm the last guy that says, you know, poor, poor, pitiful me. Well, you know, it's interesting because it's changed our lives, all of our lives, so much. And it's amazing to me that we're able to continue a schedule, even on Zoom, as we're doing here now, uh, through the talent of the IT people at uh, Egan Television. Uh, but Thomson Reuters, where our studio is located, is locked down. And they just made an announcement that people will work from home until October. So we don't know if we're going to get back in that studio or not. We may be doing this for quite a, an extended period, which is more than I think anybody anticipated. But the other side of the coin is, as long as we're able to do it and stay healthy, uh, that's a plus. And uh, go ahead. I'm very curious to see how this changes people's habits and it changes the way we do business. There are a lot of companies now that are actually thinking, you know, this is maybe the way to go in the future is to have people work from home and, and Zoom and what have you. Uh, my son works from home. My son's an economist. He works for an investment bank that specializes in agriculture and energy concerns. And he's got his office set up in his, his condominium. So he's there full time. Uh, my wife is working from home. My daughter works for the conservatory, the Como Conservatory, and that's closed. But, you know, she's uh, an essential employee in that she's got to show up to keep the plants alive, right? So, you know, it, it's, it's, again, I'm very curious to see how all this is going to shake out, how people are, are going how much of our lives have changed that are going to stay changed where people are going to say, yeah, you know what, let's work from home four weeks, four night, four days out of the week, or let's uh, do this or let's do that. I think it was uh, either Australia or another country uh, in the Far East that proposed uh, changing from now on to a, uh, uh, I hope you're drinking something good, uh, to a four day work week. And that's something uh, proposed in the hopper, uh, as well as, uh, you know, and I think we'll consider it yesterday, Facebook announced that 50% of their uh, people uh, were going to work from home permanently. They're going to cut down the staff somewhat, but they're going to have 50% work from home permanently. Now, that's, that's certainly a big difference. And it affects things. It affects things like, although, uh, in fact, you, you shared breaking bread with us at one of our favorite restaurants where we used to go uh, at least uh, once a week or every other week at most. And uh, what, we, what we do now is we call in an order and we pull up at the curb or I pull up at the curb and out it comes, a uh, complete, whole complete meal. Uh, but it's a whole different world. And, uh, you know, it would be nice to spend more time with people 
and maybe we'll be able to do that to some degree if we socially distance now. I don't know. But, uh, so your family uh, is all around. Do you get a chance to see them? Yeah, we do. Well, we do the Zoom thing. Plus, uh, I used to bribe my kids to come home because I, I called it the House Right Cafe and Coffee House free Wi-Fi. And I would post my menus for the week. And I would send it to them. And the kids, oh, I'll be, I'll be there on Sunday for this, or I'll be there on Thursday for that. Uh, I had them over to the house uh, this Tuesday. And I had, I had tables set up in the driveway like a, like a bistro. And, every, you know, we're all a certain like, you know, distance apart and that sort of thing. So we did that. Maybe I'll do that a few more times in the summer. But other than that, no, I haven't touched my child in three months. Well, mo most of our kids are back east. But in September, uh, my son moved here from Florida. And... Uh, it certainly has enhanced our lives to be able to have one of the kids around. The other side of the coin is when he comes down, as he's coming down on Memorial Day Monday, uh, is we will practice social distancing also uh, on the on the deck and the barbecue and things like that. But uh, it is a whole distant world, a uh, different world. And his dog does not uh, believe in social distancing with my dog. So. They frolic, but uh, well, that's the way it is. <clears throat> so, uh, has Renee had any other uh, experiences other than the one where she saw the thing fly off the shelf? Well, like I said, she's been involved in this. Uh, we we do ghost tours, and she knows some psychic people, and and she's she's had things happen. Uh, but now we're looking for them. And sometimes you find what you're looking for. Again, I, I'm not trying to convince anybody with the book that this is real or imagined. I'm just writing about the world that, that this exists in and we'll let people decide for themselves. As I said, usually it's a personal experience that makes it you is. believe. It is, and it's a very different one. Uh, Josh, did I see you give us two fingers or... Uh... <laughs> Josh is telling me to wind it up, and I have a lot more I wanted to do. Uh, fascinating. Don't miss From the Grave by David Housewright when it comes out in July. David, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thanks for having me. We'll have the you next know what? One. Anytime you want to chat, feel free. I'm not going anywhere. No, I want to hear about the next one also. All right. Shoot me an advanced copy on that one when it's available. Yeah, I, I will. And other than that, regards to family and tell Renee I'm still waiting for her to accept an invitation to be a guest on Access because she has such a fascinating life. I mean, you're just a writer. That's one thing. <laughs> she's, she's done everything. Unbelievable. Yes. Pass that along. Know. And thank you so much. Thank and you. Thank, thank you all for tuning in to Access to Democracy with David Howard.